All right, we'll wait for everybody to have a seat and we'll get started here shortly, okay? I first want to welcome everybody here. I'm excited to have such a great turnout. This is really awesome. Um, really excited to have all you guys here. Um, just a little background information about me. I'm pretty new to the Memorial Medical Group. I've been here for almost two months now. Um, I came from Shreveport, uh, just finished my residency in where I served uh, as chief resident up at LSU in Shreveport, okay? Um, I uh, did my undergraduate at Texas Tech University and then my medical school at the University of North Texas in Fort Worth and then went to uh, LSU and Shreveport from there. So that's kind of a little bit of background about me. My wife has family that's uh, from the Kinder area, so that's what kind of what brought us down to this area. So definitely excited to be here and excited to see uh, so many new faces. So my talk today is called The Skinny on Cholesterol. And so really what I want, to, can, you, can everybody hear me first off? Okay. I don't, have, I don't have a microphone, so I, just let me know if you guys can't hear me in the back, okay? Um, and also, if you have any questions at any time during the talk, let me know, okay? So the purpose of today's talk is for, for you guys to really understand what cholesterol is, why we care about it so much, what affects cholesterol, and what you can do to uh, help treat cholesterol and lower your own cholesterol, and then what we do as physicians uh, prescribing medications and kind of the thought process that we have whenever we prescribe medications for treating high cholesterol. Okay, so this is this is the outline, you know, and this is basically what what I just talked about. Okay, so we'll talk about what the different types of cholesterol is, what it means when we say things like LDL or bad cholesterol or HDL and good cholesterol, what those actually mean. We'll talk about why cholesterol is important for the body what it does for the body, and then why too much is bad. Um, we'll, d we'll talk about how diet affects cholesterol, how exercise affects cholesterol, and then you know, talk about how sometimes there's nothing you can do about cholesterol. It's so sometimes it's genetic factors and things that were passed down from your family. Um, and then, like I said, we'll, we'll talk about an overview of the medications that we use for cholesterol. And then at the very end, we'll kind of talk about uh, the thought process that whenever you talk with your doctor about why we use certain medications and why we prescribe the things that we do. So um, just as far as what cholesterol is, cholesterol is basically fat that's found in the body. It really comes from two places. Three quarters of your cholesterol is produced in your body, is made in the body, in the liver, um, and then tw only a quarter of it comes from what we eat. So, which, th you know, that's kind of a surprising fact to most people. You know, you really think that uh, diet and exercise alone can affect, you know, your cholesterol dramatically, which it does have a great impact on it. But your body generally takes care of itself, okay? But too much of anything is bad. But, um, and so cholesterol, it circulates in your, in your bloodstream. Okay, and the way, the way to think about cholesterol is kind of like oil and water. You know what happens whenever you put oil and water, they really don't mix. You know, they, they separate, you see the oil droplets on there. So when it's in your bloodstream, it has to be packaged into things called lipoproteins. Okay, and that, that, that allows it to circulate through your body and do the good things that we like about cholesterol, and it also allows to uh, for the negative effects of cholesterol. Um, and when we talk about lipoproteins, the, the three main ones that we talk about are high density lipoprotein, HDL, low density lipoprotein, LDL, and then we also talk about triglycerides as well whenever we talk about cholesterol, okay? Um, so what, what is HDL? So HDL is typically what we refer to as the good cholesterol. This is what we like whenever we, we talk about your lipid profile, uh, whenever we check your cholesterol. This is what we refer to your good cholesterol, your HDL. We like, um, first of all, the kind of the function in the, in the body, what it does, as you can see by our diagram, our HDL tends to carry the, the cholesterol away from our arteries. This kind of represents an artery, and, and this is the HDL carrying 
the cholesterol away from our arteries and takes it back to the liver where it's either removed or reused for something else, okay? And so that's why we think of it as the good cholesterol because having high HDL is protective for heart disease, okay? The converse is true where low HDL increases your risk for heart disease, okay? Um, HDL is mainly affected by exercise. So the more active you are, the higher HDL levels will be, okay? We'll also talk about some other things that affect HDL cholesterol a little bit later on. And so this is the big one, okay? This is the big one that everybody focuses on, and this is the thing that we're most concerned about as physicians is LDL cholesterol. And we call this the bad cholesterol. And for good reason, just like as we saw in the previous slide, HDL carries the, the cholesterol away from the arteries. LDL tends to pile it on, okay? When LDL builds up on the walls of the arteries, it makes plaques right here. That's that word right there. And these plaques cause hardening or stiffening of the arteries called atherosclerosis. Okay, so that's kind of where those, all those words come from. We know that the higher the, your LDL cholesterol, the, the, you have more risk for heart disease and heart attacks and strokes, okay? Simply because if you see, this is, this is what your heart looks like and you can see these few big blood vessels, those are called your coronary arteries, okay? They come off right here, right where, this is called your aorta, right where your aorta comes out of your heart. Okay, these are really, really small blood vessels, but they're really, really important in what they do. Okay, they supply blood to your whole heart. Okay, so if you can just think of a, a tiny tube, you build up a little bit of plaque in there, the blood flow to the heart or to any muscle is reduced. Okay, and that's how you get chest pain, is when your heart's not getting enough blood flow through these arteries, okay? And if they ever become blocked by a blood clot or if one of these plaques ruptures, you have a heart attack, okay? And so that's why we care about LDL cholesterol so much because LDL causes this buildup of plaques which causes the atherosclerosis which can cause heart attacks. Yes, ma'am. So what kind of, so the question was is how can we tell what's the most effective way of finding out if we have plaques in our arteries? So, and it's kind of a, a complicated answer to that question. Um, as we age, plaques tend to happen, okay? So as we get older, we know that we have some sort of plaque buildup in our arteries, okay? And it's not until it becomes significant or the, the area gets, the diameter of your, your arteries gets clogged so much that you start reducing that blood flow that, that we have symptoms, okay? So blood, blood test won't, won't show that. Blood test will not tell this. The, the best way of looking at the coronary arteries, for example, would be a test that the cardiologist does called a heart catheterization where they go in through the artery and they go into this and they shoot dye directly into the artery and they can see the areas that are narrowed. Okay, that's, that's the best test of telling the coronary heart disease. Now what about a nuclear test, would that show? So nuclear testing is a little bit different. It, it tells us, it looks at perfusion or blood flow to certain areas of the heart. It's not a direct test like the coronary. So when, whenever they do the heart catheterization, they look at the coronaries directly. They see a picture of it. So that's why it's the best test, the gold standard of, of looking at uh, coronary artery disease, okay? And we'll talk about it a little bit more. So the, the heart catheterization is an invasive test and it's definitely not a test that we do on a routine basis because it is invasive. Okay, um, is there a less invasive way? There, there are, but there aren't anything that we use on a regular basis, okay? We'll talk about risk factors for heart disease and what we do about that um, and kind of 
our, our rationale for treating cholesterol and what it does for you a little bit later on, okay? Um, and the, the last thing that I want to mention is triglyceride levels, okay? So triglycerides are the most common fat in the body. It's in the food that we eat. It normally comes from animal sources, serves as a major ener energy source for the body. It's also important when we talk about cholesterol simply because really high triglyceride levels increases your risk for heart disease, just like the LDL cholesterol does. Um, and if it gets really high, you're, you're at increased risk for things like pancreatitis and things like that. So when we talk about your cholesterol panel, we talk about these three main things that we care about when we're treating high cholesterol. The HDL, the LDL, and the triglycerides. So as we kind of mentioned before, why, why do we need cholesterol? What's the purpose of it? If it causes all these bad things for our body, heart disease, increases your risk for stroke, heart attacks, why do we need it? Well, it's really important for the structure and function of our cells. So it really, when we talk about our cells, you know, our whole body's made up of little teeny tiny cells that make up our skin, all of our organs. Cholesterol serves as kind of the outer layer of uh, those cells. It's, it's important in cellular function and cellular sign signaling and things like that. Um, and it's also a precursor to vitamin D, which I'm sure you guys have heard about vitamin D, which is really important for bone health. And then it's also a precursor to our steroid hormones, like cortisol, which is adrenaline, our sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen, as well as aldosterone. Yes, ma'am. Question about the word precursor. When you say cholesterol is a precursor of vitamin D, are you saying that it makes us use the vitamin D better, or so what? Vitamin D is uh, made in the body from cholesterol. So. Okay. That, that's what I mean by the word precursor. Okay, thanks. Yes, ma'am. So if you lower your cholesterol a lot, you're lowering your vitamin D level. Not necessarily, not necessarily. Um, like I said, most of your cholesterol in your body is made in your liver. You remember when we talked about three quarters is made in your liver? So your body will compensate for itself and it, it will make everything that it needs, okay? Your body's still gonna make cells and vitamin D and all the hormones and uh, steroids that you need, but we know that excess cholesterol is bad. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. And so this is kind of what we already talked about. So high levels of cholesterol, specifically LDL, can deposit and cause these plaques, which cause atherosclerosis. Okay. So this, this right here is actually if those coronary arteries that we saw on the beginning slides, that, that main artery that goes down the front of the heart is called the left anterior descending artery. And this is a cross section of that. So we're looking at the tube and they cut it. And this is, this is the outside of the artery. And we can see here, we have a whole bunch of plaque build up in the artery. And then this is blood clot, okay? And so this is what happens whenever you have a heart attack, is that you're predisposed with a reduced blood flow in this artery because of these plaques, and then a clot happens in the artery. And as you can see, there's nowhere for blood to go in this artery, okay? Completely stop the blood flow. And so that's why they had a heart attack, okay? And so that's, that's what this says down here, is plaques can rupture, uh, predispose the blood clots in the arteries and cause heart attacks, okay? Um, and this, this goes on to say the same thing, okay? So it, I, I repeated this several times because high cholesterol, we care about high cholesterol because of the risk for heart disease. And that's, that's the main reason why we care about cholesterol and that's what we're trying to prevent whenever we treat high cholesterol is trying to keep these arteries open. Because we know that heart disease in America is the number one cause of death in America, and it, it's, it's a somewhat preventable disease, okay? What produces uh, LDL? LDL, so LDL is made in the liver, um, and it's, it comes from several things which we'll, which we'll talk about here 
in a little bit. It comes from a number of factors, genetics, what we eat, um, what we consume. Like I said, anytime you eat too much of anything, it's a bad thing, okay? So it comes from excess, what the body does not need when the LDL goes really high and, and it will tend to build up in the arteries. So when we also, I just wanted to put this in here because this is just kind of our risk factors for heart disease, okay? Being overweight, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, which we're talking about today, smoking and alcohol abuse, stress can also be like that, uh, be a risk factor, high fat, high calorie diet, which obviously affects your cholesterol and your weight, and then just being sedentary, okay, which we kind of talked about earlier, how HDL cholesterol is protective of heart disease when it goes up, the high density lipoprotein or the good cholesterol, and that's mainly affected by exercise, okay? Um, things you can't change, age, okay? Like what we talked about before, you're gonna have a tendency to build up plaques in your arteries over time, which there's not much you can do about that. Um, gender, family history, uh, hereditary and race, and then being a postmenopausal woman. So, again, this kind of uh, reiterates what we just talked about. Um, things, you know, this is what I want you guys to focus on right here. Things you can change yourself. Diet, you know, a diet especially that's low in saturated fats is, is kind of where we want to focus on. And we'll talk about what saturated fats are in a little bit. Weight you know, having a healthy weight, and then staying active, physical activity. So, this kind of is a, a summary of things that modify our two main lipoproteins, our HDL and our LDL. So for our good cholesterol, our HDL, this is the one that we want to be high because it's protective of heart disease. Things that affect that, alcohol and moderation, Okay, niacin and fibrates and statins, which those are all medications we use to treat cholesterol. Stopping smoking, that will raise your HDL cholesterol. Estrogen, um, and that's part of the reason why being a postmenopausal woman is a risk factor for heart disease because it lowers your HDL cholesterol when you don't have the estrogen. Weight loss you know, which that comes with exercise, eating right, that raises your HDL cholesterol. Um, what lowers it? Kind of the opposite. Smoking, diabetes, obesity, kind of the metabolic syndrome, not doing any exercise, and high triglyceride levels can lo all lower your HDL cholesterol, which we know low HDL cholesterol is a bad thing. It's a risk factor for heart disease, okay? Alcohol, I said alcohol in moderation, <laughs> okay? And it, it will raise your HDL cholesterol. Yes, sir, it will, okay? And we're talking about less than two drinks per day, okay? Uh, <laughs> so LDL cholesterol, this is, this is the one that we care most about, LDL cholesterol. So what we want this number to be low. This is the bad cholesterol. We want this one to be low. So what, what raises that? Our diet affects that. So dietary fats. We'll go into more what that means in a little bit. Diabetes, obesity, thyroid problems can do it, kidney problems, liver problems. Sometimes you're genetically predisposed to have a really high LDL cholesterol. Things that lower it, medications estrogen, losing weight, and these are more medications down here, okay? So when we talk about treating high cholesterol, the, the first thing that you should always do is what you can modify on your own, okay? And probably the best uh, set plan for that is something called the therapeutic lifestyle changes that was actually, um, there's a big series on it through the government um, and it's called the TLC. So when we talk about TLC, that stands for Therapeutic Lifestyle Changes. 
and it really consists of three parts. And those three parts are going to be diet, physical activity or exercise, and weight management. Okay, and this is all stuff, this should be the cornerstone of any kind of treatment for high cholesterol. Okay, this should be the first thing that you do before you even do on, before you even get on medications. So why is diet so important? This is just a little study that they studied what weight loss and exercise did for people. So they saw that not even a 2% reduction in weight was associated with almost a 10% reduction in your LDL cholesterol, okay? So if, you're, if you just lose 2% of your weight, you can almost get a 10% reduction in your LDL cholesterol, which, you know, that's a great benefit, okay? 2% of your overall weight's really not that much. You can easily modify your diet or start exercising and achieve that 2% goal, okay? Um, and then diet alone is, is a, always a good thing, but it depends on many factors. A lot of it's genetically determined. And um, as far as, so diet, how it affects your LDL cholesterol, a lot of that's genetically determined. Um, people with a higher BMI or people with higher weights tend to have less response with diet on your LDL cholesterol. So when we talk about the, the TLC diet, we talk about a diet that's low in saturated fat, trans fat, and cholesterol, okay? So these are all things that I want you all to be aware of, what, what these words are, because these are all on pretty much every nutrition label in the grocery store. You can look at this on everything that you eat. This is, it's required by the government to report this on all your foods, okay? So th these, are, these are words that I want you to start paying attention to when you're out shopping, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll show an example of what everything looks like. So saturated fat is basically fat that's a solid at room temperature. So we're talking about butter or cheese. Trans fat is fat that's been hydrogenated it's just kind of a fancy word, chemical process. We find that in stick margarine, baked goods like breads, crackers, cookies. And then cholesterol, cholesterol mainly comes from food from animal origin. Egg yolk, shrimp, whole milk, those are all things that are high in cholesterol, okay? So, hydrogenated is kind of a, a a chemical process that is put through few, through foods that you basically add a hydrogen ion onto fat. Yes. So um, you never see trans fat on labels anymore because we didn't be so conscientious about that. But you always see hydrogenated fats on the labels. Are they synonymous or not? Yes. Yes. And so this is just kind of the, the sample, sample label that we see. Um, and so the first thing, whenever you guys look at these food labels, what, what the most important thing to look at? Serving size, okay? So that's, you know, a lot of times you look at a chip bag and, you know, there's 40 servings in the bag. And so you're looking at, you know, your chip bag divided by 40 what this actually means, okay? So this is the first thing that you look at, serving size. So this is just an example of light margarine. So their serving size, one tablespoon, okay? So this is one tablespoon of margarine. Um, you know, and if you're using more than that, obviously you have to multiply that to see, see what you're really getting, okay? So that's the first thing you look at. I would never eat margarine. <laughs> that's okay. No. Okay. Uh, and, and I eat very little, very little. Well, now. But I would never eat margarine. <laughs> okay. This is, this is just an example. So the next thing, the next thing you want to look at is what, what your calories are, what this is going to do for your body. Okay. 
Um, so when we talk about losing weight, losing weight is basically what it boils down to is using more calories than what you take in. Okay, um, and so calorie counting can help. Uh, these are the things that we just talked about. Our total fat level, our saturated fat level, our trans fat level, our cholesterol level. And these are all things that you want to try to limit. Okay? And just, you know, this is just in general, 5% is low, 20% is high. You know, that, that's just a general reference. And these are also things that are important to look at. Our fiber content, which is very good and then our vitamin levels down here, okay? Um, and so when we talk about what, what is recommended for the TLC diet, what this means, what, what we should try to limit our calories to. So, you know, your caloric intake is really a function of who you are, you know, your gender, your weight, your height, you know, uh, your daily caloric intake is what you need for your body to survive on a daily basis, okay? And that varies per person, whether it's 1,200 calories a day, 1,500 calories a day, 1,800 calories a day. It's all, you know, based on your individual needs. But just as a reference, saturated fat, which that's the one that we wanna, we wanna focus on the most, we wanna have that less than, they say, 7% of our total calories. And then they break that down in the poly and monounsaturated fats. Uh, they want that less than 10 and 20% of our calories. Our total fat should only be about a third of our diet. And then we go on to things like carbohydrates. Fiber is a good thing. Fiber is really, really good for your diet. And we'll talk about that here in a second. And then this is what I mentioned before. Our total calories, you know, the, the, the key, what losing weight boils down to is using more calories than what you take in, okay? And so we already went through this, um, and uh, just a couple things on fibers. So there's really two main types of fibers that we talk about. One's called soluble fiber and one's called insoluble fiber. What does fiber do for you? Increased fiber helps protect you from heart, heart disease, okay? Other things that it does, it actually blocks cholesterol absorption in your small intestines and your colon. So that's part of the reason why it helps protect against heart disease. And then it makes you feel fuller faster. So that way you can kind of limit your caloric intake. So when we talk about sources of soluble fiber, you know, sometimes this is, they have a gelatinous texture like jams. Um, it, it can protect the stomach from things like heartburn, helps treat constipation, and you find it in fruits, vegetables, legumes, seaweed, okay? And then insoluble fiber is, is typically what we think about when, when we think about fiber. It's the dry texture, things that are wheat bran. Um, this tends to have a laxative effect on the body. It protects against uh, high cholesterol. And it's found in things like whole grains, nuts, and seeds. And uh, a while ago you mentioned fibrates. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, is that so fibrates is a class of medication that we use to treat high cholesterol. It is different than fiber. But it's, it's, not related. it's not related. Okay. And so this is this is another thing that. Uh, that I want you guys to be aware of. And these, these things are called stanols and sterols, okay? These are also really important for our diet, okay? They help block cholesterol absorption too, just like what fiber does. And two grams of stanols or sterols can reduce LDL cholesterol by five to 15%. And so what do we find these in? We find them in fruits, vegetables, vegetable oils, nuts, seeds, cereals, legumes. So, you know, kind of the, the point of these two slides is that fruits, vegetables, whole grains are kind of your best friends with your diet, okay? We, and then with the, the cholesterol, the saturated fat, you know, you want to focus on things that are low in saturated fat. 
uh, lean meats, baked things, you know, stay away from fi fried foods, you know, chicken without the skin, things like that. So those are, those are just kind of uh, general things that you can do to modify your diet to help lower your cholesterol. Yes, sir. It can. It can. Yeah. Yeah. It can. It can definitely help. So, you know, like I said, everybody, the way diet affects an individual person is, it varies. So, um, just because somebody gets a 15% reduction by eating more fruits and vegetables doesn't mean that the next person will. So, it, it all tends to vary. Um, so the next, the next part of the TLC program, besides diet, is exercise, okay? So we know a lack of physical activity is a risk factor for heart disease. So being sedentary, sitting on the couch all the time, is going to increase your risk for heart disease, okay? And exercise, what, what do we mean by exercise? A lot, of, a lot of people are, you know, when we say well, you need to exercise. They, they get kind of put off and they're like, well, you know, I can't run anymore. What am I supposed to do? You know, you don't have to, you don't have to run a marathon. You don't have to run at all, okay? Um, anything that gets your heart rate up a little bit more, gets you breathing more, is something we consider exercise, okay? Whether that's walking, you know, in, in South Louisiana, I know it's hard to walk in the summer, so I always suggest walking in the mall or, you know, going out shopping, you know, in a big air conditioned area, Walmart, Lowe's, the mall, you know, all those things are, are places where you can, you know, still feel comfortable and walk, okay? Walking is really great because <coughs> low impact exercises are, re are really good for our joints. You know, as, as we kind of have the, the aches and pains as we get older, you know, we got to focus on low impact things that aren't going to be as hard on our joints. Walking is one of them. Uh, swimming is also one of them. You know, dancing, rowing machine, things that aren't gonna are, aren't gonna uh, cause a lot of impact on the joints are good. And it's one of those things that you want to start off slow. Okay, you want to start off with 10 minutes every other day of walking, walking around the block, and then you gradually increase as your tolerance builds up. And then you get to a point where you're exercising at least 30 minutes a day. And that's kind of what, what we know helps protect against heart disease. When we say you're getting at least 30 minutes of exercise most of the days of the week. So at least four days a week, if not every day, 30 minutes a day. So that's really, I mean, when you think about it in your whole week's time, that's really not all that much. Or, you know, if you exercise four days a week, 30 days, that's, or four days a week, 30 minutes, that's only two hours of your whole week that you spend on exercising, okay? In the grand scheme of things, that's really not all that much. You know, life tends to catch up to us when we say we're too busy, we got to do this, we got to do that, but this is important. You, you got you to gotta do this, you got to make time to do this. So, just wait, wait for my next slide. Hold on one second, hold on one second. So, e exercise too, you know, it doesn't have to be walking on the treadmill, the elliptical machine, swimming, playing golf, but not, not riding in the golf cart, walking. You know, that's something fun that people love to do that, you know, gets your heart rate up, gets you breathing harder, expends calories, dancing, bowling, Gardening, you know, even housework can sometimes be considered exercise, okay? So this did not come out too well, but I don't know if you can, you can see, but here's your glazed yeast donut at the top. So 242 calories on average, what does that equate to? 80, they say 88 minutes of crunches. I think that's a little excessive, but uh, this is just, you know, it, 
I put this in here for you guys to, to think about what you're eating on a daily basis and what it's going to take for your body to compensate for all that excess calories, okay? Um, and, and then this is a big thing right here, portion distortion, portion size. You know, just like with the nutrition labels when we talked about, you know, the first thing you looked at is the serving size to see what's all in there. And in the South, and especially in South Louisiana, we tend to go crazy on our portions, okay? Um, it's just something to be conscious. You know, when you go out to eat, a lot of times they give you more than one portion, you know? And I, I do it, you know, I, I feel guilty if I don't uh, eat most of my food because I paid for it and, you know, I feel, like I, I feel like that's what I need to do. But you need to be really aware of what your body's telling you, stop eating whenever you're full, and then try to limit your portion size. So one slice is coming out of mine, right? <laughs> <laughs> so everything, you know, any, anything in moderation, including sweets, is okay. All right? It's just you don't want to go and eat six donuts you know, two or three times a week. That's when you're gonna run into trouble. If you have a donut once a week, if you have a piece of cake, a piece of pie, once a week, twice a week, you know, that's not a bad thing, okay? Just, you just have to do things in moderation. When yes, ma'am. When you go to a normal size restaurant, you get a big meal, even though you don't ask for it. When you go to a gourmet restaurant, you get a small meal. You when you go to the gourmet restaurants, they tend to serve normal portion sizes. Yeah. That's the way it should be. Yeah. We, we do not, they do not supersize everything, okay? So, so what happens? So whenever we talk about high cholesterol, say you went to the doctor, he, he talks about, so your cholesterol is a little bit high. The first thing you should do the first thing your doctor su 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 suggest is the TLC program, therapeutic lifestyle changes, before we talk about medications, okay? So diet, exercise, and weight loss. That should be the first thing that we do. And then, you know, if we do that, the recommended time period is six months. If we do that for six months and we recheck your cholesterol and you're still high, then it's time to consider medications, okay? But you have, to do the, you have to do the hard work first, okay? Not everything can be fixed with a pill. That's, that's kind of the main thing that I want you guys to get out of this. The, the medications work, we know they work, but you can do it on your own too, okay, without medications. So when we talk about medications, there's several classes of medications that we use to treat high cholesterol. With this one on top, the statins being the gold standard and probably the best medication at treating high cholesterol simply because it affects the LDL cholesterol or the bad cholesterol the most. Yes, ma'am. How much can I have red, red rice meat? Is it helpful? Yes, it can. Yes, it is helpful. It is a natural way to lower your LDL cholesterol. Does it cause weakness in the No. No, it will not. And yeah, so the the other other medications that we use to treat cholesterol. So she she asked if red yeast can can be used to treat high cholesterol and it is one of the things that is good for the lower LDL cholesterol. And so these are, yes, ma'am. Can you take red uh, yeast rice and the niacin, which is taking the statins, and then the statin? You can, you can. Um, there is, when we treat high cholesterol with medications, we generally like to start with the statin medications, okay? And then in certain patients that are either really high risk or have not met their goals of lowering their LDL cholesterol with the statins, or if they can't take the statins for some reason, we use adjunctive medications to lower that cholesterol. And sometimes we'll use combinations of these things to achieve our goal. Okay, so combinations of things are okay. 
So when we talk about statins, like I said, this is the most common medication that we use. This is the, pretty much the gold standard of treating cholesterol with medication, okay? And the two that I have highlighted here, these are the most potent and the most powerful cholesterol medications. So Lipitor or Torvastatin or Crestor or Ruvastatin. There are other statin medications out there. These are probably just the most common ones out there, okay? So what do statins do for you? So statins work on a enzyme in the liver, which we know that's where three quarters of our cholesterol is made to lower your cholesterol. So what does it do? It affects our bad cholesterol the most, LDL cholesterol. It lowers the LDL cholesterol the most out of any medications. Some other things that it does, it will lower your triglyceride levels as well, and it will also tend to increase your HDL. So if we look at this, what statins do, this is what we want out of everything, okay? Out of the three cholesterols that we talked about, the HDL, LDL, and triglycerides, it lowers the two that we want and increases the one that we want to be high, okay? And so that's why we use statin medications the most, because it does pretty much everything that we want. You can lower your LDL cholesterol by up to 55% by just taking a statin medication, okay? It's generally well tolerated whenever you take it. Um, sometimes you can have headache, constipation, cramps, stomach aches. Um, probably the, the most, the thing we worry about most as physicians is muscle pain or weakness. It can cause breakdown of your muscles that you'll get muscle aches and pains, kind of like whenever you get the flu, you get those real deep muscle aches. And it can cause myalgias and rhabdomyolysis, which that's the, the thing we worry about. And as far as a side effect, you would know if that were, were to happen. And then we also have to monitor your liver function test on statins because it can also cause a rise in your liver function test. And these other ones, we won't spend, yes ma'am? What do you do if you have the muscle weakness? So if you have the muscle weakness, there's a, a couple of things that you can do. You can lower the dose of your statin medication or switch to a different statin medication. So most of the time, whenever that happens, when you have the muscle aches, we, that happens when we're using the really strong cholesterol medications like Crestor, okay? It, and, and so Crestor is probably our strongest, followed by Lipitor, so that would also be common with Lipitor. Um, options for that is to change to this cholesterol medication, Pravastatin or Pravacol, because in general, it does not cause as many of those symptoms as the other medications. Yes, ma'am. It is not a recommendation to take CoQ10 with statins. No, ma'am. Um, could you tell me what statins do that So the liver function tests, when we talk about require liver tests, what we monitor is part of a basic blood test that we perform on a routine basis called a complete metabolic profile. And it will have a test on there called your AST and ALT, which those are what we call our liver function test or LFTs. Okay, and that's what we say we have to monitor our liver function test. Um, in general, we check them after six weeks of starting medication and then periodically after that. Yes, sir. Um, it, probably fluvastatin or lovastatin, these two down here. And this is not a, the extensive list of cholesterol medications, this is just the most common. And somebody else had a question over here? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. When you're prescribing uh, really any medication that we talked about, statins, and you're prescribing it to a patient, is it better to prescribe it to a patient that has the same or a person that weighs 125 to someone that weighs 
225. Okay. So the question was, is, is the dosage the same across all weight categories? And so when we, when we pick a, a starting dose of statin medications or any medications in general, it's a function of, number one, how high your cholesterol is and what goal we're trying to achieve, okay? Uh, we know people with heart disease and diabetes, we want to lower their cholesterol really low, okay? Sometimes decreasing their LDL cholesterol by as much as, you know, 50%. So we know that in order to do that, we're going to have to have a stronger medication. Um, and how an individual responds to that is going to be varied as based on weight and things like that. It's not mainly based on weight. Um, you know, 10 milligrams of Lipitor can do one thing to one person and not even affect another person, okay? And so that's, that's why we say we... It's individual variation. It's individual variation, yes, sir. And so that's why all, whenever you start a medication, you have to have follow-up blood tests to see what it's actually doing, okay? Because that way we can track the progress of the medication and make sure it's doing what it what we want it to do okay and if it's not then we make changes and so that's kind of the way we approach that yes ma'am so it typically causes what we call myalgias or muscle aches and pains if you get leg cramps at night, that could be a different thing. But it could, so that's kind of a, a, a loaded answer there. It could be, but uh, most of the time it's a different thing. Because most of the time you'll have muscle aches pretty much continuously, which will coincide with either starting or increasing your cholesterol medication. Okay? Well, this is leg cramps. Gotcha. And, and this yeah. is at night. Maybe it's some, some way I'll turn around or yeah. move. Yeah, and that's that's probably something different. Yes, ma'am. Keep taking it. it. It's fine. It's fine. So, um, like what I was saying earlier, there is no recommendation from any guidelines to take CoQ10 with a statin or cholesterol medication, but it it will not hurt. Okay. And so these other ones I, I want to mention because some of you could be on these medications. Um, these are all adjunctive or add-on medications to statins. Or if you are intolerant to statin medications, these are medications we can use. So we talk about bile acid binders. And these are examples of bile acid binders. Probably the most common one is Wellcall. These work to lower LDL cholesterol. They're kind of neutral on triglycerides and HDL. They can lower your LDL cholesterol by as much as 30%. Uh, most of these times you have to mix these, uh, these powders with water, juice, and food. They inhibit the absorption of other medications, so you have to space them out. So if you're taking one of these medications, you have to space it out from the other, your other medications that you take to not affect absorption. Um, and they can cause kind of GI symptoms. Nicotinic acid or niacin, this is uh, it's actually vitamin B3. This mainly affects our HDL cholesterol, okay? This will mainly raise our HDL cholesterol, but it can also lower our triglycerides and our LDL. Uh, the big thing with this one, it will cause facial flushing or feeling hot in the face. Uh, we want you to take with food or baby aspirin to prevent this flushing, okay? Uh, and then cholesterol absorption inhibitors, the only one of this that we have is Zetia or Azetamibe. This again affects cholesterol absorption from food. Sometimes we combine this with the statin to lower your cholesterol, LDL cholesterol even more, up to 25%. Um, again, GI symptoms are probably the most common with that one. And this is that fibric acids that we were talking about. These, this is different than fiber. 
and these are the most common ones, lopid or tricor, and these mainly affect triglyceride levels, okay? And then have a few changes on our HDL and LDL, but mainly triglycerides. Take these with food, and again, GI side effects. And then the same thing with fish oil. You know, this is an over-the-counter thing. This may affect triglycerides only. There is a prescription called Leveza, and this is a supplement that's over-the-counter. Okay, so now that we kind of talked about what cholesterol is, what affects cholesterol, what, what you can do yourself to treat high cholesterol, this comes down to the question, what, what should your cholesterol be? And that, that's, a, that's a really good question, okay? And it really depends on a number of different things. Age, your medical history, what your medical problems are, and what we feel like your overall risk of heart disease is, okay? So we know that if you have heart disease, if you've had a heart attack in the past, or if you're really high risk for heart disease, we want your cholesterol to be really low, okay? We want your LDL cholesterol to be low. Uh, same thing with diabetes, okay? If you have diabetes, we really, really want your cholesterol to be low because we know diabetes is, is a really big risk factor for heart disease, okay? And this is something that, you know, you should be engaged in talking with your doctor about because the, the answer for one person is not the same for the other, okay? Um, it has to be individualized to what your cholesterol is, what your risk factors are, and what your conditions are that we're trying to prevent, okay? So that's, that's why we, in general, this is what the old cholesterol guidelines were. This is called the ATP3 guidelines, and this is what, uh, you know, up until two years ago, what, what we as physicians were looking at when we looked at treating high cholesterol and kind of the guidelines that we followed, okay? We looked at your LDL cholesterol. If it was less than 100, we said that's really good. Um, and then it just kind of went on from there. Greater than 190, we said was really high. We looked at total cholesterol. We said if your total cholesterol was less than 200, that was good. Your HDL cholesterol, if it was between 40 and 60, this low and high here, we said it was okay. They revised these guidelines in uh, 2004, I believe, and they, they changed a few things. I'm, I'm gonna go fast through this because this really, I don't want you guys to focus on this because um, this is something that's individualized and that you really need to talk with your doctor about. Um, and again, this is, they just kept updating this and this is what we follow now, okay? That's good, that's good. You don't need to see this, okay? So this is, this is in, at the end of 2013, the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology came up with a new cholesterol guideline, okay? Um, this is one of those things that is, has been slower to be implemented by everybody. Um, a lot of times uh, physicians will still follow this ATP3 guideline simply because this tends to put a lot of people on statin medications or cholesterol medications, okay? Um, and so this is kind of the algorithm that uh, as clinicians that we, we tend to follow. Um, anybody with heart disease or diabetes should really be on a cholesterol medication, okay? According to our guideline here. LDL cholesterol, greater than 190 should be treated with a statin medication. Um, and then the, the dosing of statin medication is depend on your risk factor, uh, which is a calculation that's a function of age, gender, uh, your total cholesterol, your HDL cholesterol, whether you have diabetes, heart disease, or hypertension, okay? And that, that's kind of what uh, what these will determine whether you get a moderate or high intensity statin. Okay, again, this is not anything that you guys need to worry about. This is just kind of what we think about as physicians, the, the thought process behind the decisions that we make, okay, is based off of this algorithm, okay? Um, 
And so that's why I said this is why it's important to talk to your doctor. Okay, this is why it's important to have the discussion, to make sure you have regular follow-up, to make sure that we're checking your cholesterol on a regular basis, and to make sure that if you're being treated for high cholesterol, make sure we've achieved the goal that you want. Okay, because this gets complicated. Okay, so that's pretty much all I have to say right about all the cholesterol. You know, we went through pretty much everything. Uh, does anybody have any questions right now?